welcome to the world according to CLSA. Today we have with us the Brains Trust of CLSA and joining us first is Christopher Wood, their global equity strategist. Chris, thank you very much for joining us from the sidelines of your conference, which I'm sure is attracting a lot of attention in India. Uh, first up, uh, the big discussion around emerging markets is this tightening global liquidity. Uh, do you think there's more to go in terms of uh, growth scare or investors scaring away from emerging markets? Well, no, I think, yeah, there's more to go in terms of the downside risk from monetary tightening, but I think the story has moved on from just emerging markets to global equities in general. At the beginning of this quarter, the U.S. equity market was the last man standing, and now that clearly had a corrective phase in October. So until monetary tightening ends in the U.S., I think that risk remains. In the short term, though, I think there is a possibility, a distinct possibility of a rally if we get a U.S.-China trade deal uh, before the next wave of tariffs are due to kick in, and I'm still hoping for a trade deal. Okay. If we had such a trade deal, then that would uh, lead to a rally in Asia. Okay. Uh, well, uh, in that case, let me stand the question on its head. Uh, you know, this far we have seen, of course, as you said, U.S. as the last man standing. Generally, developed markets doing far better than emerging markets. But now has the valuation uh, divergence gone so far that actually at current values, EMs have become attractive? Oh, no, I think valuation-wise, they're definitely attractive. In my view, um, the big underperformance of emerging in Asia relative to world markets, U.S. markets has peaked out. So I think the fact that the U.S. corrected in October means that this tightening is now kicked and hit on all markets. And so I would agree we've seen the worst of the underperformance. But so long as we have U.S. monetary tightening, and we still have it, um, there's clearly a risk of further downside risk. I just think uh, it's not going to be purely confined to Asia and emerging markets. But a very important point for emerging markets, is, and particularly Asia, is is this US-China trade issue resolved or does it get worse? We either get a deal before year end or we don't get a deal and that will become very negative because then there'll be a big increase in tariffs. Then I think China will be much less likely to do a deal with the US and then the risk grows that China gives a signal to uh, its, its population to stop buying American goods. So that's the risk that we don't get a deal. But my base case is there'll be a US-China trade deal. And the most likely time it's agreed is around the G20 summit when the U Mr. Trump's meant to meet, meet the Chinese leader. Uh, hi, Krish. This is Nimesha. Uh, Krish, what is your base case on, on crude now? Because you know, I was reading a uh, rep uh, report and you clearly suggested that you know this crude rally which we saw of late is just temporary and you'll probably see a pullback from there. And actually crude has pulled back in the last few days. What's the general base case for, uh, for crude and what that means for India as well? Over oil, well, I believe, no, I think, you know, I think the biggest risks for India right now are external. That is uh, further appreciation in oil and further appreciation in the dollar. So we've had some relief from oil, but in my view, this correction you've seen in oil is almost is primarily attributed to the U-turn you saw from the US on, a, on the Iranian oil issue. A month, two months ago, the market was assuming the US was going to enforce these measures extremely aggressively, that people who bought Iranian oil were at risk of so-called secondary sanctions. Uh, the US did a total U-turn, and as a result, oil has corrected. But that U-turn is now discounted. And in my view, if demand for oil holds up in the emerging market world, which for now it's clearly doing, there's a significant risk that oil trends higher over the next 12 months. So that, to me, is the biggest risk as regards India. Mm. You know, when the OPEC spoke about uh, crude prices uh, uh, earlier this week, they said that they, are, they see a scaling down of demand as well. Uh, they were scaling down growth both uh, uh, in uh, globally as well as uh, demand from India. So do you think it goes back to 86, 90? Who, who's, who's scaling? <laughs> it was OPEC's view. Hmm. Well, all I know is that people every year underestimate demand for oil in emerging markets. 
So the track record suggests that emerging market demand for oil continues to surprise on the upside. India is not so far off in GDP per capita terms, the level China was in 2001-2002 when Chinese demand had a, went materially higher. So I think the long-term risk is that demand for oil continues to grow in the emerging world unless you believe that everybody's going to be driving electric vehicles in the emerging market world. And so far that is more hype than reality. Uh, Chris, uh, coming back to India, you know, specifically on India, uh, uh, Chris, uh, you know, I, I know you've been you've been quite bullish on Indian markets, and even in a model portfolio, you used to own a, quite a bit of uh, NBFC stocks, the likes of India World Housing Finance, Group Finance. Given the liquidity crisis that we saw in the last uh, few, few weeks, what is your general view on the NBFC stocks in India? On the what stocks? On the NBFC stocks? The, the non-bank uh, finance. Sorry, which stocks? Non-bank non -bank financial, financial companies. companies in India. Oh, you mean the financials? Yes. No, I, I, well, no, I, well, I always look at them. The, I look at financials, both financials and non-bank financials. Mm. I, I wouldn't make a big distinction in the long run. Sure. So I've always had exposure to this sector ever since I began this portfolio in 2002. Mm. Uh, but clearly, in terms of the recent parts, past, there's been a massive hit mm. to these stocks because of the unfortunate default of a triple a credit which mm. if a triple a credit suddenly defaults you can understand this is a shock to the system and this clearly is going to cause a significant slowdown in growth in this area and clearly is creates the risk that uh, investors don't, no longer trust indian credit ratings so that's all very unfortunate but that's already hit the market um, so in my view uh, in the long run i definitely still want to own this area because I think both in consumer finance and housing finance are long-term growth stories. And my view is that the this, this very dramatic sell-off you saw in these stocks has probably discounted any slow, the, the undoubted slowdown that is now coming. Um, but it, from a point of view, my own portfolio, it's unfortunate because my portfolio was up for forming the benchmark quite decently until it went completely the other way because of this, uh, this specific development. In terms of the ricochets from this development, obviously we had a massive outflow out of the bond funds in September uh, as investors panicked on what happened. But it is, so it's actually reassuring to see some inflows in the month of October. But to me, this is an area we just need to monitor, but long term, I definitely want to continue to own affordable housing plays because I think the affordable housing policy, well, I don't think, I know the affordable housing policy is kicking in. We're getting growing completions of affordable housing units. I also remain of the view that the Indian real estate markets in early stage of recovery. Okay, well, uh, just a word on the fixed income space in India as well. Uh, like we saw uh, uh, foreign investors moving out of Indian equities, they moved out of Indian debt uh, in even uh, more emphatic quantities. But uh, in the past week, we have seen them come back and come back more uh, clearly into Indian debt, uh, go government debt basically, sovereign debt. Uh, do you think rupee is stable enough and uh, yields have, uh, uh, you know, fallen enough for uh, yields to become, for government debt to become attractive? Yeah, my basic view, what I've been telling foreign investors for a long time, that if you can get 8% yield on an India 10-year government bond, local currency bond, in my view, that's good value. So anything of 8% or higher, I think, is attractive. In my view, the, the monetary policy in India in recent years has been quite tight, if not very tight. If you look at interest rates relative to headline inflation, you have high real interest rates. And in the long run, that should be government bond market bullish. So uh, I'm not surprised to see the evidence that foreigners are beginning to come back. To me, the risk on the currency is simply two externalities, which is really outside the Indian government's control. One is the oil price we've discussed, and the other is how long the Fed tightening cycle goes on. So my base case is the Fed tightening cycle should end by the middle of next year at the latest. But you know, if I'm wrong on that, then the headwinds will go for longer. Because so long as you have a combination or continuation of the current combination you have in America, namely fiscal easing and monetary tightening, 
it's dollar bullish. Okay. Well, we can see that clearly. Uh, but uh, uh, let me come to another issue which your colleague uh, Mahesh has already flagged. But as a person sitting outside India and looking at all countries, how do you look at this uh, repeated downgrading of uh, Indian earnings? Uh, this is the sixth year in a row, Mahesh uh, has pointed out, that uh, earnings are not firing as promised. Does that uh, uh, make India a, a, a slightly less attractive? No, well, what's amazing, because you're absolutely right to highlight that the performance of corporate earnings has been has underperformed the performance of nominal GDP in India. So nominal GDP has been much better than corporate earnings. As a result, corporate earnings, I'm sure has highlighted this point, corporate earnings have gone to an almost historic low relative to GDP. But I'm kind of looking at this from the contrarian standpoint of how much worse can it get. So actually the amazing thing is how resilient the Indian stock market has been during all these years of earnings disappointments. But next year I'm hoping, or not hoping, to, my base case next year is we will finally see evidence of the long-awaited capital spending cycle in India and that should be the catalyst for better earnings. So my base case is to increase my overweight. Right now, I'll be looking to increase my overweight in India early next year. If, this, uh, if, um, if I get more confident that the CAPEX cycle is returning, and if my base case, if I, if I continue to believe my base case on the politics, and my base case on the politics is that the Modi government will be re-elected, albeit with a reduced majority. Uh, Chris, exactly that. Which, so I want to yeah. I want to see the Modi government re-elected with, with the majority and the capex cycle kicking in, and then that would justify uh, increase in weightings in India. Uh, Chris, this, that was exactly my point. You know, next eight eight to ten months are going to be very uh, busy in, uh, election calendar for India. And as you rightly pointed out, you know, you believe that the Modi government will come to power. Is that something which is ge which is getting priced in? Uh, you know, when when the global investors look at India. Uh, no, well, I think in the short term there's going to be growing no noise that the Modi government will not be re-elected. But so people will be looking to signs that these state elections are not going well for the current government. There's likely to be an anti-incumbent vote. But these local, these state elections, in my view, are elected on, uh, on primarily on local issues and should not be interpreted as a big signal for next year. So I would expect growing noise and concern on the part of investors that the government will not be re-elected, but my base case is that they will. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher Wood, for joining us and uh, giving us your worldview as well as your India. Now we are joined by Mahesh Nandurkar, the India specialist from uh, uh, CLSA. Mahesh, thank you very much for joining us. Well, uh, we already spoke to you about your latest report, which has kind of sh uh, shaken the investor community somewhat, that you waited for six years for earnings to pick up and it's not happening and there was a big downgrade that you handed down. After listening to the guys in the conference, are you any better off, any more optimistic? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's just the first day uh, we had the conference, uh, so I haven't really met all of the people around. But yes, I mean, we've already seen uh, the corporate result season, which, uh, you know, obviously was not that great. And, uh, you know, we in the street cut the earnings estimates by, uh, you know, quite a lot. Uh, and as we mentioned, uh, you know, in our note, it's the, uh, you know, highest uh, sort of reduction in the earnings estimates that we saw. Uh, in the last like 11 12 quarters the, the only good thing i would say is that uh, when I, uh, some of the downgrades uh, especially in the corporate uh, sort of banking sort of segment that was more because of the provisioning costs being higher than expectations but not because of the higher npls or not because of the higher slippages so to that extent it is uh, you know just advancing of the cost and postponing of the earnings uh, so that was the good part. You know, the other sort of positive part uh, from the results is, and I would say that the consumer staple results were still quite okay. Uh, you know, was quite good to see the IT sector hiring. Uh, you know, showing sustained pickup. In fact, now the uh, you know IT hiring growth uh, is uh, you know at the highest levels that we've seen again in the last seven eight quarters. So, yeah. So those those were a few bright spots. But yeah, but by and large, uh, the earnings uh, season doesn't seem to be uh, going great. 
Okay. Was your skepticism a bit too early? Uh, is it still not possible that, uh, as you said, you know, this large provisioning because of the aging of NPAs, all this has distorted the overall uh, earnings growth somewhat and uh, maybe next year is finally going to be that big year of earnings growth? Yes, we are quite hopeful. Uh, so we are actually projecting, uh, you know, somewhere around 20% earnings growth for FY20, uh, precisely because of the same reason that we feel that the banking sector will see a pretty sharp increase, and some banks will actually show earnings jumping by 2x, 3x, 5x, etc., of a very, very low base, of course. Uh, so yes, that's that's something. But yeah, but in terms of the earnings revisions, uh, so while uh, you know, sort of banking sector, one can understand, but we've seen uh, revisions in. Uh, you know most of the other segments as well like you know autos and uh, you know cement and so on so um so the earnings sort of downgrade was was not dominated just by the banks it was pretty uh, sort of widespread uh, hi mahesh uh, you know how are, how are investors <coughs> taking this uh, report of the earnings downgrade because it's been six years now when well, the markets have doubled from uh, in the last six years but the earnings have not the pad growth in the last four years has been pretty stagnant how are global investors reacting to this uh, you know no earnings for the last four years and still valuation so high uh, are they now looking to throw in the towel for india yes uh, you know as you would see uh, the foreigners have already sold about six billion dollars worth of equity year to date in 2018 calendar and uh, the primary concerns uh, you know from the point of view of a foreign investor is this you know valuation versus earnings uh, you know mismatch and uh, now if you look at uh, the other emerging markets uh, you know india uh, stands out as the only emerging market among the bigger ones uh, where the valuations are still trading uh, you know at a higher than average uh, over the last 10 years and you look at brazil or china or taiwan korea etc you know the uh, uh, the uh, the bigger emerging markets, uh, you know, all of them are now trading below their historical averages. So, uh, and I think the reason why uh, you know Indian markets continue to trade at a higher level is uh, the continuous uh, retail inflows that we see. Uh, while uh, the pace of inflows have reduced, but still at an absolute level, uh, anywhere around one billion dollar or one point three billion dollars a month is still a very healthy uh, level of inflows. Um, so yeah, so from the foreign investors' point of view, uh, the valuation still continues to remain a concern. Mm -hmm. Are people willing to keep the faith because some of the uh, ground realities have changed? For instance, GST. Yes, early collection problems will be there, uh, teething troubles, but uh, logically it should, uh, uh, you know, accelerate in terms of tax collections and tax to GDP ratio. Likewise, the ba uh, bankruptcy code. Are people giving more brownie points and uh, allowing more waiting period simply because these are one in a generation or one in several generation changes? No, you're absolutely right, Lata. Uh, so in fact, we, we ourselves have been highlighting that the long-term structural story uh, is still very much intact. In fact, I would say has gotten strengthened uh, because uh, you know of the bankruptcy code or because of GST. Uh, in fact, you know I would actually also sort of you know, want to point out, you know, one factor which doesn't really get so much of media attention uh, is the inflation management. Uh, and uh, you know after the 2016 amendments into the RBI Act now it's very clear what the role of RBI is uh, and the inflation will remain within the 4% plus minus band and you know if you look at uh, you know many other emerging markets uh, you know where we have seen some shocks or accidents uh, most of them have actually uh, you know had some kind of a root in inflation mismanagement so from a global inf uh, sort of investor point of view uh, this uh, change uh, in the RBI Act gives them a lot of visibility that uh, the inflation is going to be much more predictable and uh, the RBI uh, you know, will be taking uh, sort, of, uh, 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 sort of enough steps or, or sort of enough actions to keep inflation that way. I, I, think, I think that gives a great uh, uh, sort of, you know, sense of confidence and comfort to the foreign investors. So in many ways, uh, the uh, growth outlook is, uh, you know, over a longer term, is much more robust and strengthened. Uh, but yes, it's the near term which is uh, you know, where we need to be worried about. Yeah, uh, you said that it's an underappreciated fact or uh, under-noticed fact that uh, there is an inflation management program. I am often accused of overemphasizing that point. Uh, but uh, how would you therefore look at the financial sector, especially the NBFCs? Uh, there may be a temporary liquidity issue, of course, but uh, 
uh, you know, given the fact that uh, the cost of uh, capital will be controlled by the overall uh, inflation management program, are you already picking up gems there? No, we still continue to remain, uh, you know, quite cautious uh, on the NBFC space, you know, barring uh, like, uh, you know, just one or two, maybe like very high quality names. But, you know, we, we, we still have a very cautious view. And the reason for that is, uh, while NBFCs, uh, you know, I don't think it's like a really systemic issue. I mean, there are a few NBFCs which are having a problem. Uh, uh, but, you know, most of the others would still be able to sail through this, uh, you know, quite comfort, not quite comfortably, but will be able to sail through. But that sailing through will come at a, a cost of significant slowdown of growth. Uh, uh, I mean, I uh, you know can very easily see that you know many of the NBOCs will need to sort of give up growth completely. Uh, you know, maybe over the next three to six months, and you know, obviously there will be some uh, second level impact as well. Uh, yeah, but you know whether the market has uh, you know already uh, brought the valuations down to uh, you know these very low growth environment for certain NBFCs, my uh, you know answer to that is low. And uh, you know the the reason why you know I also have a slightly different view is that. You know, when we are looking at the valuations of the NBFC space, or you know, for that matter, the broader market as well, uh, you know, we uh, you know are making a comparison with where the multiples were in the last three years or the last five years. I, I think that's not really uh, you know a valid comparison to make. I mean, if a stock was trading at like five times, six times price to book, and it has now come down to maybe three or four times price to book, I think you know we need to go back to the ground level and say that whether the three x or four x is justified to start with. Uh, and we can't justify it, given the fact that okay, it traded at five or six times, uh, you know, about a year or two years ago, because what has really changed. Uh, you know, is the global funding environment has changed dramatically, uh, you know, five years back, or I would say, you know, on an average over the last five years, the U.S. LIBOR rate was almost 0%, now it's 2.6. Uh, the Euro LIBOR is still negative, but our house view is that there will be tightening uh, in, in Europe as well next year. Um, so in like many ways, and, you know, of course, it, you know, even in India, uh, uh, the bond yields have gone up and uh, the cost of funds for NBFC segment has gone up as well. So in many ways the cost of funding has gone up across the board globally as well as in India and the PE multiples or price to book multiples need to take that into account which hasn't happened to uh, you know to the full level uh, according to me. You've added some PSU names as well into your model portfolio. Is valuation the only benchmark because you know in an election year a lot of investors believe that there could be a risk to, you know, playing into the PSUs at this point in time. What's your general take on, on the PSUs, the likes of NTPC, ONGC, that you've added to the uh, model portfolio? Uh, see, you know, we are not really taking uh, either a pro-PSU or non-PSU kind of a call. So these are, uh, you know, some of the, you know, the value stocks. Uh, that we definitely, uh, you know, like and, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, valuation is, uh, you know, one of uh, the sort of criterion for stock and sector selection, uh, you know, which, which uh, you know, probably was not that important uh, over the last few years. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, sort of investment strategy, I think we need to pay greater attention to uh, stock valuations as well. A final question, uh, which I should have asked uh, Christopher, but uh, uh, you you would have also got the feedback. Would foreign investors be terribly upset if there was a change of guard at RBI, either governor or deputy governor? Yeah, so the foreign investors have, uh, you know, really admired, uh, you know, India's central bank because, uh, you know, this is one of the central banks which actually, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, given greater sort of, you know, comfort and confidence to the foreign investors. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, if, if there were to be sort of any uh, sort of big disruptive changes, uh, that would definitely uh, kind of, you know, uh, make investors think. Uh, but given the fact that, uh, you know, RBI is a very solid institution uh, and and, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, the governors changing, you know, every three years or six years. Uh, and, you know, what we've seen is that uh, the institution has kind of, you know, uh, uh, sort of provided, uh, you know, uh, uh, talent at all the times. Uh, so, yes, I mean, there will be, uh, you know, some uh, sort of question mark from the foreign investors if there were to be like a sudden and disruptive changes. Uh, but, uh, you know, I guess the institution as a whole, uh, you know, still remains very robust uh, and uh, that would still continue to be, uh, you know, the source of confidence uh, for the foreign investors. Good to hear that and one hopes of course that uh, we don't have any accidents to report.